so we're at the course website. I'm going to pop open to full screen here, which you of course could do if you wanted to return to the uh, navigable lecture. Clicking on number three here, popping us into lecture three. And again, this is Christianity in the Bible, and we're going to jump right in to Genesis, the opening book for the Hebrew Testament. It's arguably the case that the first three chapters of the book of Genesis are the most influential two pages ever written in the Western tradition, as they not only provide the founding myth, but the basis for a variety of ideologies such as creationism that stand behind the religious convictions of somewhere between a billion and a half and two billion peoples if you take into account all Jews, Christians, and Muslims living in the world today. So enormously influential. Besides the actual, you know, religious basis for a number of people today, they also have arguably shaped Western civilization, civilization more than any other two pages as well. What I mean by that is these this text and the ideology that comes out of it is just repeated again and again in Western literature. I mean, maybe most famously in something like Paradise Lost, which is actually a massive opening up of these two pages, but it's 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 pervasive and 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 all over the place in Western literature, and we'll be looking at that throughout the course. So we're going to be focusing on the environmental import, but it's also the case and worth noting that this has profound influence on a variety of other things. So, for example, women and gender. This, of course, tells the story of women being created subordinate to men, being made subordinate to men. Gender relations are laid out in a very clear way for the rest of the Judeo-Christian tradition because of it. Creation, this is after a, all a founding myth, so you know the whole notion of how the universe comes into being, how long that took to happen and all, that's clearly laid out here and of course has, you know, in the last hundred years, became an issue of, um, of some great contention as it is in conflict with uh, modern science, evolution, and a range of other things, I should say. It, it's difficult to believe in the literal creation as laid out in Genesis happening 6,000 years ago, and also the Big Bang, um, which happened, you know, 13 and a half billion years ago. The very notion of evil that, that you know, permeates Western civilization comes from here, the idea of sin, which is not inherent in, in other religions from other parts of the world necessarily, but here it is laid out very clearly. This is, after all, the moment of original sin. This is when evil enters the world and human beings, in this case Adam and Eve, sin for the first time. Um, what do they sin over? Arguably, sex comes into the um, the, the equation. Um, it's certainly with Adam's fall in so far as, you know, Eve is, is portrayed in a very Pandora-like way as being this sort of sexual snare for men. Adam gives him to temptation and he sins. That's the nature of his fall. Even before that, Eve's sin, arguably with the phallic ser ser serpent and all that, also involves um, sex free will, the whole question of how much, you know, uh, um, individual agency human beings had here, how much is preordained by God, if God is omniscient, omnipotent, what does he know, what doesn't he know, huge issue, again, taken up again and again by thinkers in Western civilization. Human destiny, what happens to humanity after this? I mean, humanity is now in a state of nearly irretrievable decay. The only thing that will save them, of course, the only intervention in this destiny of, of you know, woe and and decay will of course be um, the uh, intervention of Jesus as the Christ. Cosmology, of course, this is the creation myth. It lays out cosmology. It lays out the universe and how it all fits together. It's incredibly important. Labor comes into the scene um, in two senses. First, you know, why do women have to, to suffer in childbirth and labor? It's because of original sin directly. And more importantly, at least for our purposes, from an environmental point of view, why is it that human beings now are in an adversarial relationship to the earth? Why doesn't the earth spontaneously provide for all our needs the way 
it once did in some sort of golden age in the prelapsarian age before the fall again human sin brought this about animal rights the whole relationship that we have and it's laid out very specifically here in um, the opening chapters of genesis our relationship with animals with birds with fish um, we are given complete dominion over them according to this although that's up for um, interpretive debate our whole notion of deity um, we've seen you know earth-centered deities before things like home baba genus loki and the myth of gilgamesh this is an entire new type of deity coming on the scene here um, completely metaphysical being outside of the physical although maybe some connection to the physical again that's a question of interpretation but again two short pages three chapters of genesis and an enormous amount of things are being weighed in on here it's an astonishing number of things even if you're not one of the one and a half to two billion people for whom this is the the literal founding myth well you know these ideas have come into the post-christian world in ways that we may not be aware so for example the whole dualistic notion that human beings are both spirit and flesh somehow we are this physical body but also something more in the um judeo-christian or christian tradition especially that we are soul that we possess the soul that we are in, as it's sort of rewritten by uh, the philosophical tradition that we have a mind which is separate from body um, those beliefs are not necessarily in any way inherent in, in in thinking at all but of course they come in this western tradition in part from from this text and and other parts of the judeo-christian bible as well as the philosophical tradition of people like plato and all but the notion important notion here is you don't have to necessarily you know be for someone for whom this is an important religion just text for it to influence um, your way of thinking yeah we read alongside of Genesis of course this this enormously influential controversial article by Lynn White jr. Um, it really kicked off in a modern way a reevaluation of Christianity or in religious grounds you can look back and see this earlier as well there's actually a biting indictment of Christianity on essentially environmental grounds by Nietzsche early in the um, uh, early in thus book Arasustra but here for the first time theorists are beginning to weigh in on it in a really sort of big popular kind of way um, enormously influential but very short article and you know for all those of us who have to sit down and write essays whether as class assignments or to publish uh, this should be encouraging because just a few pages can really influence millions and millions of people because many environmentalists following white and sometimes independently um, began to think of Christianity as not being very earth friendly um, a number of other religions starting in the 1960s but really in the 70s 80s and 90s began to get a lot of attention from environmentalists things like Taoism Shinto Buddhism and maybe especially of, at all especially at all in the United States Native American spiritualism as these were seen as more earth friendly and in some cases earth centric religions biocentric religions so that they they just seem like a perhaps a better paradigm religiously I want to say at the very beginning because this is of course uh, um, a sensitive issue because you know there are so many people for whom this is an important text and there are uh, maybe especially in the United States um, quite a few people who take these first three chapters of Genesis as literally true there would be no debate over you know the teaching of intelligent design and um, evolution in the classroom I think um, if it wasn't for this text um, I am not saying that this necessarily is environmentally uh, um, an impossibly an impossible text um, in fact I note here Al Gore obviously a Nobel laureate for an environmental prize is a devout Christian he's found a way of working this out it all comes ultimately down to a hermeneutic issue how you interpret the Bible how you interpret this religion if you interpret it the way Lynn White Jr. did even though he tries to redeem it at the end of his article with the discussion of St. Francis Sissy it's kind of tough but there are other people and we'll be talking about one of them at the very end I just mentioned um, Jeremy Cohen who wrote a book about this and, and did not find um, that pre-modern Christians or Jews found um, this 
text as a wholesale license to exploit the environment. But it is a question of interpretation, which is what we're uh, going to embark on right now. So, this is the text. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters. So, this goes on and on. And again, one of the, um, I mean, the theme of the course is to interpret texts like this that may not seem to have a great deal of environmental import from the start, from an environmental perspective. And let's jump right in on that now. So let's start at the very beginning with the first chapter um, um, of the first verse of the first chapter. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It may not seem to have environmental import. But again, from the very beginning, the Bible postulates a metaphysical God, one who is apart from, possibly superior to, a certainly creator of the whole of creation. As he is metaphysical, the Judeo-Christian God is similar to Shamash, the God that championed Gilgamesh that we met in his epic. And again, you know, the word metaphysical here comes from two Greek words, meta, which means beyond, and uh, phusis, which means nature. So a metaphysical god is one who is beyond nature. This god is outside of nature. Now, that's going to be debated, his exact role, and in part, it comes down to when he does this creating act here, what does he create nature and, and everything out of? Some people argue that um, this is traditionally in medieval and thought after it, that he created everything out of nothing. That's called ex nihilo, Latin, from nothing. Others argued that this was an ex deo creation, that the creation was created uh, ex from deo God. So in that sense, the whole of creation could in fact be part and parcel God too, so maybe more environmental friendly. But certainly there is a rift that opens up here. God is separate from the creation in some way. He's a metaphysical God standing separate and apart and superior to a physical creation. Obviously such a deity is radically different from an earth deity like um, a genus Loki like Hom Baba. You know, those deities are intimately connected, part of the earth. Judeo Christian God is not part of the earth, in some sense, stands apart from it. Even if it's created out of him, he still is in a privileged position outside of it. He is superior to his creation. Now, you may not agree with this, and um, you can reinterpret this text, um, you know, that's what hermeneutics is about, and, and perhaps see God is not superior to the creation. But I just note this because many environmentalists, especially early in the, um, the modern environmental game in the 1960s and 70s, did just that. As a consequence, not only is you know God separate, this God separate from His creation, it arguably opens up a rift between the physical and the metaphysical. He is metaphysical, metaphysis beyond nature. So not only is that His existential state, but it suggests that there are these two realms: the physical and the metaphysical. Um, we're going to see that again with Plato and others. Um, and, you know, in Plato, it's the realm of the a day of ideas. It is some sort of meta physical realm, separate and apart from sense experience and the physical. This metaphysical realm in Christianity, of course, becomes heaven, which is separate and apart and different from the creation. In either case, whether it's Plato or whether it's Christianity, you have this binary structure in opposition between the physical and the metaphysical, and what is privileged there of course is the metaphysical sense. Physical, again, you know, originally was the word phusis, nature. This is a little, this is potentially a little disturbing in so that the meta, insofar as this other realm is postulated as superior to nature. So Genesis and the environment. This of course is Lynn White Jr. 
one of the reasons that I started with the Epic of Gilgamesh is because it wonderfully introduced this character, Hombaba, a genus Loki, and the problems that a genus Loki presented for um, someone like Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, of course, wanted to, and his people wanted to exploit this great cedar forest, but there was a prohibition in place, religious prohibition, um, based on an early earth-centered religion, which would not allow the wholesale exploitation of the place. To do that, and this is, you know, the story that's epically, symbolically told in Gilgamesh, there had to be a fight between Gilgamesh and Hombaba. Um, of course, Enkidu helped. And the, you know, the triumph was that human beings overcame these older earth de this older earth deity, in part because Gilgamesh is championed by Shamash and once the older earth deity is taken out and removed from uh, the scene then human beings can exploit the um, the environment there in a mode of indifference. Um, Lin White Jr. argues essentially that that's what happens with Christianity. By destroying animal paganism, Christianity made it possible to exploit nature in a mode of indifference to the feelings of natural objects. So not Gilgamesh, you know, literally fighting a genus Loki, but Christianity systematically encountering earth religions and their, their deities and, and defeating them. We're going to see that in, in a medieval text very clearly, the Dream of the Rood, where Christianity encounters one of these older earth religions, in this case in the, on the British Isles, and triumphs over it by absorbing the earth religion into itself, then ultimately casting out what it thought of as pagan aspects. Interest incidentally, the word pagan comes from the Latin pegos, which literally means pegus, um, something rooted in the earth, like a stick planted in the earth. To Christians who saw themselves as sort of free and able to transcend the physical realm and be up with God in a metaphysical, heavenly realm, pagans were those who were moored to the earth. They were stuck in the ground. They were always part of the earth. Um, in that sense, like a genus Loki, like Hombaba, they are part of the earth. And to Christianity, that became their defining characteristic. What made Christians different than pagans was that they were not, you know, moored to the earth, tied to the earth, that they were free to soar above the metaphysical realm. Yeah, so this is it then, according to Lynn White, what we saw in the epic Gilgamesh playing out in a um, sort of epic, you know, imaginative way is literally the history of Christianity. It encountered older earth religions, genus Loki in particular, and systematically killed them off. Once they were killed off, there were no longer any deities to protect the earth since the Christian deity was beyond it. And we're going to see for in a moment how the Christian deity uh, um, entrusts the, um, the management of the earth to human beings. So, once genus Lokis are gone, once older earth religions are gone, according to white, human beings have no prohibitions against exploiting the planet. Yeah. Um, just to, to put white's article in historical context, Again, a short article, but enormously influential in the history of ideas, call, causing scores of environmentalists and Christians and Christian environmentalists in the next few decades to radically reconsider Christianity and to, uh, to think about how um, Christianity caused human beings to relate to the planet. Yeah, this is the idea. When Christianity came, there are no more any genus Loki. They're they're symbolically defeated, and or they're literally defeated. And there's no, according to White, prohibition against the exploitation of nature. Christians, championed by an incredibly powerful metaphysical god, are given the right by that god, as we'll see directly, to exploit um, nature. It's a mode of indifference to the environment. The old inhibitions to the exploiting of nature crumbled with the advent of Christianity. Again, not to not to confuse things, but this is of course the same story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And to to be fair to Christianity, um, coming out of this part of the world, the um, the nature that the the idea that that nature religions have to be sort of overcome does not begin with um, the Hebrew Testament. 
the Epic of Gilgamesh is probably 1500 years earlier and yet we see the same thing happening here. But it is the way, both with Gilgamesh and the Hebrew Testament, that the relationship between human beings and the environment is being worked out by way of a metaphysical god in Rome. Because in this way of thinking, you know, earth religions are, are more responsive to the earth. They set up prohibitions against its exploitation. They actually deify it. Many environmentalists, having rejected Christianity as problematic on environmental grounds, um, have looked to new types, to other religions that are more earth friendly, such as Native American spiritualism, which, um, especially in the 1990s, became a real. Um, rallying cry for environmentalists because it gave an alternate paradigm, an alternate way of thinking to the Western tradition that we're exploring. And um, that's certainly true, and it's certainly true. And also it is the case that it is a, um, an early earth religion like the one, you know, Humbaba was involved with or the one that Christianity are supposed to have systematically eradicated and kind of did, that um, that's still alive and well, although certainly marginalized with the, um, the conquest of the uh, North American continent by uh, Europeans. This is an extraordinarily strong statement on the part of White and, and may be right. Um, if you think environmentally and are concerned about larger environmental issues, this could be the greatest psychic revolution in the history of, of our, i.e. Western culture, in that it, rep it repositioned human beings with rela in relationship to the planet. No longer are human beings in a uh, position of um, subordinates to the environment. No longer do we worship the environment, but we now have um, dominion over it. And we'll see how that happens directly here. Keep in mind how this happens. It is a metaphysical god being substituted for earth deities. New type of deity is on the scene. An incredibly powerful one, separate from, separate and above from the rest of creation. This god creates creation, he owns creation, he is fully, has full power over all creation, omniscient, omnipotent. And then the question is, what, what is our relationship to this deity and, and um, the environment or our planet? Yeah. Um, it could be the decisive moment in human history when this religion came on the scene. That's the strongest form of this argument, that it led us down the path where we are now. And we're going to talk a little bit about how it licenses us to have, um, have a relationship to the planet. So, Genesis chapter 1, let's move forward a little in the... Uh, uh, passages we're looking at, uh, verse 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And so it was. So, read environmentally, the Judeo-Christian God is not only a metaphysical deity superior to the earth, the earth is subordinate and obedient to God as it does his will. All of the natural processes here on earth are ruled over by this metaphysical God. So a passage like this, I'll just go back to it for a moment. You know, let the earth bring forth the grass. Earth, you do this. Not only does this God create the entire physical realm, including the earth, of course, but this physical realm, make no mistake, the earth is subordinate to God. God gives commands, the earth listens to it. This is not, um, in this way of reading it, like the, um, the idea that God put into motion something that he then stands back and lets do what he wants. He's specifically giving orders here. He is in charge. Make no mistake about that. Yeah. Keep in mind that this, you know, is again another form of this dualism, which is potentially problematic from an environmental point of view, as it marginalizes the physical and finds the physical subordinate to God. So it's a binary structure, the physical, the metaphysical. The metaphysical creates the physical. The metaphysical is control, in control of the physical. The physical is, you know, the subordinate and marginal um, member of the dyadic structure. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all of the earth, and over, and over 
every creeping thing that creepeth upon it. This is Genesis 126, 128. And God blessed them, sort of a repeat here, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that creepeth upon it. Um, we're going to look uh, at these words here, fruitful and multiply, what these words mean, especially in Hebrew, what replenish means, what subdue means, what dominion means. These are all incredibly strong words, and in each case, you know, you are replenish what? The earth. What does that mean? Subdue the earth. What does that mean? Have dominion over everything here and over everything that moveth on the earth. What does replenish, subdue, and have dominion mean in this context? So, we saw earlier, God creates the earth. He has complete dominion over it. He is actively involved in controlling it and giving it commands. What is the relationship now that human beings have to their creation? Well, God, who's in charge, this is his to do with as he please, he gives then dominion to human beings. He hands over the keys to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the earth, to us, to do with as we please. So argue environmentalists. And it's very clear that this is all life on it, right? It's animals, it's fish, it's, it's um, birds, it's everything is then centered on human beings. Human beings have a special privileged position here in the physical realm. As a consequence, Lin Wei Jr. says, Christianity has to be the most anthropocentric religion that the world has ever seen. Anthropocentric means literally, of course, it's the word, no doubt, seems when you look at it, earth-centered. It's a key concept for modern environmentalists. As I suggested, everything on earth, plants, animals, etc., is centered on us, subordinate to us, here just for our use. And it's pretty um, strongly argued by environmentalists that what we just read, Genesis 126 and 128, say exactly that, that all this is here for us, that it's all centered on us, that we have a privileged position in it. Um, that's why White is prompted to say that no other religion comes close to being as anthropocentric as Christianity, making humans so central to the, the rest, central and superior to the rest of the planet. Incidentally, the opposite of anthropocentrism is biocentrism that suggests that no life is superior to, on Earth is superior to any other. So human beings are, you know, one form of biological life. There's no reason to say that we are superior or have certain rights over um, pl any other animals or fish or, or birds in the air. And many Earth-centered religions, which, which take that position that we are in no way special as human beings, um, environmentalists have championed over Christianity because they're, they're just the opposite of that radical anthropocentrism of Christianity. They're, in fact, altogether biocentric, according to um, that view. It's, it's a compelling view. So, continuing with uh, chapter 1. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, we saw this chapter, verse before, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. In Hebrew, replenish is male. It means to make fill, full or abundant or to fill, to fill up. So when you replenish the earth, in this sense, it means to fill up the earth. Subdue, you're subduing the earth, is kabash. It's a strong word. It's hard to put a, um, a favorable uh, interpretation on this, to be honest, because it means to subdue, to force, to tramp down. What are we supposed to do to the earth, or what are we, are we entitled to do and enlisted to by God? Well, we can kabosh, we can subdue it, force it down, tramp it. Dominion, which is probably the word that's most often uh, um, now in modern times referred to environmentally in terms of these passages as rada. Again, it means to rule, to dominate, to tread down. It's again a very strong word. In Latin, by the way, and mo for most of the, uh, the last couple thousand years, the Hebrew Testament has been read in Latin by Christians, uh, with the Vulgate especially, the Vulgate Bible. Um, in Latin, dominion is dominus, which means to be lord or master over. So that was the interpretation of the word. Uh, in any event, it is, um, it's, it's, it's a strong word, and it's clearly saying that human beings have dominion to tread down, 
the earth as we are its lord and master environmental critics and probably not surprisingly have all suggested that all these words um, suggest a disturbing posture toward the earth um, Mala, if you remember the word for replenish, has additionally been interpreted as worrisome because it encourages human beings to overpopulate the planet, which obviously is environmentally problematic. So it's not just that human beings have, you know, dominion, they are lords over nature and they can dominate and tread it down, but we're also, you know, instructed by God to fill the planet with, what, human beings. be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. Environmentalist and White Jr. again is one of the first to argue that these lines are very clear on how we should relate to other animals. In fact, all life on the uh, earth, we are, according to this passage, Lord and Master of the planet, um, given those rights by God. Um, and the planet then is here to serve us. Obviously, environmentalists um, from the very beginning of the modern interpretation of these passages by White and others have found this problematic. Also, if you read, um, and again, we're not, you know, these are just a few pages that we're reading here. Genesis 124 to 27 and then um, 2 7 recount very different creation stories from. Uh, for human beings from the rest of the planet. This is um, radically different than, for example, the modern theory of evolution, which suggests that human beings are just, you know, um, one of any number of other um, forms of life that emerged over the, you know, the ages on the planet. No, it's not that way here. Human beings are fundamentally different. Their creation is different. They're seen as superior to everything else. They're created individually by God. Everything else God says calls forth for the earth to do it to create human beings. God takes a special hand, you know, takes a special role here to create human beings or, or found, created in his image. It makes human beings fundamentally different from every other form of life on the planet, which of course evolution contradicts because it suggests that, you know, all life on earth that we've found so far shares the same DNA. Although there is, as you may know, um, the prospect that there may have been a second uh, genesis, so to speak, and another form, other forms of life that we may not have interpreted and not have discovered yet on the planet um, that maybe began a second, have a second evolution, probably like viruses or something. Anyhow, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Yeah, to overpopulate the planet. Um, there are, of course, in another debate, which is still, which is partly centered on these two pages, um, regarding you know free um, um, uh, the right to life and the right to choice and birth control. Arguments against birth control uh, can be made from a number of passages in the Bible, but Genesis one twenty eight is one that they are made from, because God says you know. You are to fill the planet. You know, you're not going to fill the planet as effectively as God wants you to if you're using birth control and practicing things like abortion. Um, you should have as many children as you possibly can because Genesis 128 um, shows that God has given a biblical mandate to do that. Obviously, um, you know, now that we have 7 billion people on the planet, um, this is questionable. I'm sure when it was written nearly 3,000 years ago, the prospect of human dominion over the planet reaching 7 billion people may not have uh, been an issue, but today it is. And if you read it today in a literal sense and do not practice birth control or abortion or, any, or have any concern for that, um, there may be environmental consequences. So are you environmentalists? Yeah, it's, that's it in the nutshell. Genesis 128, yet another, yet not only problematic for the dominion and, and the, the rule over the planet, but um, what it suggests as far as um, population density. So jumping from chapter 1 to chapter 2, And God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So in Hebrew, Adam, Hadam, literally means made of clay, and a related word, Hadama, is the word for the earth. In spite of the fact that Adam here is fashioned directly out of the earth 
For nearly 2,000 years, Christian theologians have argued that the human beings have a dual nature, half body and half soul, the later being the better. So this would very much be like what we saw in the myth of Gilgamesh, where human beings are created from the earth. They are clay, they are part of the earth. Uh, in, in some metaphorical sense, that's kind of what evolution says. But here, Christian theologians have argued that that's only half of our nature, that this whole divide that is opened up between the physical and metaphysical, you know, between the metaphysical God and, and his creation, uh, that that realm extends to human beings too. And only human beings, giving us an even more privileged position over other animals, insofar as traditionally other animals are not imagined as having a dual nature, having a soul. It's only human beings that have both, um, making us more special and, and half in the realm of God, half God-like. Yeah. So as this binary structure and opposition has emerged over time, this dualistic belief that there is a physical God and a, a metaphysical God and a physical realm, a physical world, and a metaphysical realm like heaven and a physical world, the earth here, um, so is it that human beings also have these two natures. And in each of these binary structures, one side is clearly marginalized, the earth is inferior, the soul is the superior part, and the heavenly metaphysical realm is superior. Everything on earth is seen, and this will emerge with Plato too, and, and, and mesh with Christianity, with Scholastic and other medieval and Renaissance thinkers. Everything on earth then is potentially illusory, inferior, perhaps even evil, and a temptation. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a thoroughgoing metaphysical, physical dualism here. If, you know, I mean, it raises the question, what is our physical nature? What are our bodies? This obviously has consequences beyond environmental, you know, people will see everything related to the body and the senses and the body's functions like eating, you know, eating too much will be seen as, as sinful, caring too much about the body, enjoying the body too much sexually. All that is potentially evil and sinful. And at the end of the game, it may be that the body itself is the source of evil and temptation and problematic. Again, this is an interpretation. You need not interpret the Bible this way. Although, clearly, uh, for 2,000 years more, um, or, or certainly with Christian thinking through the medieval and Renaissance and beyond, this was the interpretation that the body is evil, a temptation. That, yeah. So, talking a little more about dualism here. The implications of metaphysical dualism are profound. We've been talking about this, but let's be clear about it. If human beings are merely visitors here on Earth, spirits suffering bondage in physical bodies and on a physical planet while making their way back home to be with God in a distinctly unphysical, unearthly realm, then how much does the Earth really matter, if at all? This is the question. If now we have this divide, if human beings are only temporarily here, if the physical you know, world, everything on the planet is merely an illusion, and we're really trying to get back to our true home, to the metaphysical realm with God, to abandon our physical aspect, to become not dualistic, but purely metaphysical, how much does the earth really matter at all? This is only a transitory stop for us. Environmentalists have argued, yeah, it makes us like bad hotel guests, you know. If you're really uh, uh, um, disrespectful of a hotel room, you can trash the room and, you know, why care? It's not your home. You're not going to be uh, uh, living there. You're, you're going to be out of there very shortly, so who cares? It's only a transitory thing that you, uh, that you encounter, but you're on your way to be uh, in your true home, which is imagined as far superior to this realm in every way, and that's the realm with God in heaven, where um, Christ, that's the great you know, reward for Christians and arguably where they really belong. So 
in other religions, of course, if it's you know earth-based religions, um, there is no sense that you have uh, a true home elsewhere. This is your home. You are born here. You die here. There is nothing beyond this, either before or after. This is everything. Environmentalists have looked carefully at that because you know all life, all th everything exists in this one place, and that's all there is. So we need to to take care of it, you know, because not just for ourselves while we're here, but this is all there is and you know we have children and grandchildren we want it to be here for them as well we don't want to be encouraging them to look to some other place um, when in this in these belief systems there is no other place other than the here and now those of course are monistic they're not dualistic in any way so looking at um, Genesis chapter 2 a little more and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden to dress it and to keep it to dress in Hebrew is abad. It means literally to work for another, to serve another by labor, and to keep a shamar, which is to keep guard, to keep watch, to protect, to save life. Um, this is a different. This verse uh, allows for a different interpretation than we've seen so far. Environmentalists have looked at Genesis 2:15 um, favorably, suggest that human beings are actually genus Loki, interested to protect against Shamar, the planet. Um, this has been a rallying point for uh, for environmentalists uh, for an environmental friendly approach to the Judeo-Christian tradition. And um, well, as I suggest here. Um, interpretation plays a major role in our understanding this and in fact any text so you know what do you do with the uh, the first three books of Genesis how do you interpret it it is all a hermeneutic question it's what we're embarked on in this class um, maybe it, the suggestion is that human beings are here to take care of the planet we're going to see this return again, especially in the Renaissance with something called the Christian stewardship model, which suggests that, which argues that human beings are mandated by God to shamar, to protect this place and take care of it. That attitude is alive and well today. In fact, I think it's fair to say that's the cornerstone of Al Gore's belief system. Um, it's one of Christian stewardship, that we have to take care of the planet. For that attitude to happen, however, a lot of thinking has to evolve along the way and the nature of the physical realm um, as it relates to God has to get worked out and um, that won't really happen in a big way until the late Renaissance especially with people like Spinoza who argues that the earth and the creation um, is still the home of God but we'll get to that but yeah the uh, the interpretation of Christianity from in Judeo-Christian tradition rather from the first three books of Genesis is not um, as clear as it might seem Theme, although it's it is difficult to entirely um, free Christianity of, of issues regarding uh, um, environmental problems, I should just come out and say. So now we're in um, chapter three, and unto God, unto Adam, he God said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. This is after the fall, when Adam has eaten forbidden fruit, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So again, this is now Genesis 3.18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the earth, for out of it was thou taken, again Adam is Hadam, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So aside from being potentially misogynistic, these lines have um, obvious implications environmentally. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, thorns also, and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. So this is, of course, after the fall, what we call the post-lapsarian period in Christian thinking. And this is the punishment that Adam and with him all of humanity receives um, from God because of original sin. A fundamental change in the relationship that human beings have to the planet has occurred here. After the fall, human beings have a new relationship to the earth, one that is essentially adversarial. Environmentalists have found this potentially problematic. So, you know, before the fall, prelapsarian time, everything was absolutely wonderful. The earth spontaneously brought forth whatever you needed. It was uh, it was a golden age. Um, 
people were taken care of by you know mother earth after the fall it's not that case it's not the case anymore god says the ground is now cursed it is not going to be easy to make a living for human beings on the planet we have to now by the sweat of our brow you know develop agriculture we have to work very hard the earth will not provide for us will not give us spontaneously like you know a wonderful mother but instead we have to take we have to subdue the earth and take whatever we can to survive we are not on a benevolent planet anymore and we have to act proactively to get what we need and it is worrisome because it does you know it does reimagine the planet the planet before the fall benevolent kind after the fall um, you know we have to take everything that we get the planet is not going to give it to us yeah incidentally this is part of an entire uh, tradition from this part of the world we see it in Hesiod a relatively early Greek thinker who said that, you know, there was once a golden age where human beings lived a harmonious relationship to the planet. That's now gone. Virgil, incidentally, um, recounts that story. And he also introduces his own notion of Georgic, which is different than that wonderful pastoral life in the golden age where the earth provided for us. But in Georgic, it is like after the fall we have to through the sweat of our brow through very hard work take from a planet who will not give it to us um, the earth was once in all these views a locus aminus um, locus place aminus meaning friendly a word from amenable comes from it it was once all a friendly benevolent kind place it was a paradise but now after the fall paradise is lost our relationship with the planet is fundamentally irretrievably altered So again, ground is now cursed. It's now going to have thorns and thistles. It's all that it's going to bring forth unless we uh, we do something to change that. Yeah, this is a view that comes from Christian thinkers repeatedly um, for the next you know, thousands of years, and that is that after the fall, the earth is in a st in a state of irretrievable decay. Human beings have messed things up. They've destroyed the relationship with the planet. The earth is now in a state of decay and cannot be saved. In Christianity, of course, human beings can be saved. One human, one entity comes, a God-man, Christ, with the ability to save those who accept him. Um, but in this view, as environmentalists have argued, the earth is going to continue to decay. Christ only comes to save human beings, not the planet. They're in, in the strongest state. There's nothing to be done. The earth is dying. It is decaying. It's done. The best we can do as human beings is to reach for Christ, you know, reach out to Christ as sort of a um, a lifeboat off the planet to the metaphysical realm. Because if you stay here, there's nothing but decay and death. John Donne, even though he's a notorious sensu sensualist in some of his poetry that may have read, in his um, second anniversary he comes out and expresses this view in a nice condensed little form, saying that the world, the earth, is but a carcass. Forget this world and think scarce of it as old clothes cast off a year ago. Forget it. They're it's done. It's over. It's a carcass. It's dying. It's dead. It's rotting. Um, all that you need to do is get you know, save yourself, get out. Christ will allow that. But the world, yeah, forget the carcass. Environmentalists, you know, as you might imagine, find this disturbing and it suggests the planet has no future other than decay. In other words, you know, an environmental tipping point occurred 6,000 years ago, which is when the biblical fall is imagined to have taken place by people who, you know, try to trace this genealogy back in time through biblical, um, um, comments so yeah I mean and you know then of course with climate change and the new question if there's a, a another tipping point coming well you know if you if you believe this in the, the strongest terms that I've been suggesting you know why would why would uh why would the tipping point over climate change really have much 
you know, why would you care much about it? I mean, the real tipping point happened. Of course, the Earth's in a state of decay. Of course, it's going to um, to be destroyed. Well, you know, who who cares if there's this new reason that it's going to be destroyed? Six thousand years ago, the die was cast. It's over. I mean, the the fate of the planet is sealed. Um, I should mention here, of course, that. Um, I alluded to this before that, that Jeremy Cohen wrote a book, I believe, in 1989, suggesting that pre-modern Christians and Jews actually didn't think, because of the first three books of Genesis, that they could um, live in a mode of indifference to the planet. It is, of course, still being debated. In some sense, at least from an environmental point of view, this is the, you know, one of the defining debates of 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 the 21st century. Um, again, if so many people believe, you know, so many people are of the religions that come out of this tradition and this story, um, exactly what is the relationship to the planet that's being outlined here? What does Genesis tell us about that? Um, Cohen suggests that Roy, you know, it wasn't interpreted this way. Other people, starting with Lynn White Jr., you know, kind of wonder how it could have interpreted any other way. Um, Cohen's book, by the way, if you're interested in this, it's entitled Be Fertile and Increase, Fill the Earth and Master It. Um, and that is, of course, a reference to Genesis 128. And uh, finally, as an epilogue, it very much continues today, this debate. And I note uh, recently in 2007, a number of prominent Christian activists, led by a guy named James C. Dobson, who is the founder, founder of an organization called Focus on the Family, called on a national, the National Association of Evangelicals to dismiss an official who urged that climate change be taken seriously. And if you think about it from this position, um, if the Earth is already in a state of decay, if a tipping point had been mentioned, uh, it happened 6,000 years ago, then, then why worry about it, right? Um, Many of these individuals, of course, felt that their political agenda was being co-opted by those sympathetic to the pet cause of Al Gore and others. But to some Christians, I think it raised, as it did to John Donne and others, and has often, for the last 2,000 years, the larger question of just how much this place, this planet, should matter. If there is a, a huge metaphysical-physical divide, if it in every way privileges the, the metaphysical, God, his realm, heaven, the the spiritual aspect of human nature, um, then why? You know, how much should the planet matter, if at all? Um, it is, I think, in in reevaluating this religion, which is being done, you know, all over the planet now, one of the most important questions facing us today. Um, it's a question of, you know doing what we've been doing here, a hermeneutic project and trying to interpret a genesis. Um, for many of us, you know, it, it, this may be a rather academic issue. Um, you know, when we look at the myth of Gilgamesh or we look at, you know, ancient Greek religion for nearly everyone, it's academic. But this isn't. This is a matter of faith and conviction and belief for, for billions of people on the planet now. And um, ultimately, um, from our point of view, I think it needs to be stressed again that this is a question of hermeneutics. This is a question of interpretation. How do we interpret this text, these two pages? Um, it can be looked at historically, how it has been interpreted, and it can also be, uh, uh, be you know, Brought, brought into the 21st century, which is happening today, and sort of with a clean slate, looking at these texts again and seeing how they can be interpreted um, greenly. And I think that's being done. But it, um, it does still leave us with the question, which is one we will be pursuing throughout the course, that once this die is cast, once the world is seen in this way, once we have a religion set up this way in contrast to, in opposition to, and, and, and sometimes, you know, physically fighting against the older religions that were more Earth-centric, you know, it raises a question of um, how the Western tradition has evolved and, um, and, and what we believe. Okay, so that would be the end of Lecture 3. Thanks.